Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Josh Owen. I'm the Vignelli Distinguished Professor of Design and the Director of the Vignelli Center for Design Studies. Welcome to the third and final lecture of the Fall 2021 Vignelli Design Conversations series presented by Design Milk and RIT's Magic Center and made possible in part by the generosity of RIT alumnus Chris Bailey and Bailey Brand Consulting. Fostering design excellence is deeply embedded in our mission at the Vignelli Center and at RIT. Tonight, we're privileged to hear from one of our distinguished alums who extends this same mission with her work, who I will introduce shortly. Looking ahead, I invite you all to join our mailing list on the Center's website, and please stay tuned to our social channels for news about the upcoming speakers when we return in the new year. Rochester Institute of Technology's Vignelli Center for Design Studies is an international hub for education, research, collaboration, and advocacy, which expands the scope of the programs of the College of Art and Design School of Design. The facility houses the archive of renowned designers Lella and Massimo Vignelli, whose works are icons of international design. The center and archives sit within RIT's College of Art and Design, which was built on the traditional territory of the Onondaga, or people of the Great Hill. In English, they are known as Seneca people, the keepers of the Western door. They are one of the six sovereign nations that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We honor the land on which RIT was built and recognize the unique relationship that the indigenous stewards have with this land. That relationship is the core of their traditions, cultures, and histories. We recognize the history of genocide, colonization, and assimilation of indigenous people that took place on this land. Mindful of these histories, we work towards understanding, acknowledging, and reconciling. As stewards of history and content, we must acknowledge and seek to learn from our context, bad and good, ugly and beautiful. This applies to the Vignelli Center as with any archive. The Vignellis taught us that design is a systematic framework for solving the world's most intractable problems. If recent times have taught us anything, it's that we as humans are adaptable, and while this is the case, our societies and systems have significant flaws. We're at a point when we need to have difficult discussions and work to create a new balance in the world. In this, design must play a critical role. As the director, I aim to make the Vignelli Center even more accessible and applicable by bringing in stimulating guest contributors from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds who help us to consider design in innovative ways. The Vignelli's design is one philosophy leaves us with a universal message that design is a lens through which we can envision a more inclusive tomorrow. Before introducing tonight's guest, I'd like to take a few moments to set the stage. Out of respect for our presenter, participants must be muted for the duration of the event, but we do encourage you to enter questions you have for our presenter using the Q&A feature both during and after the talk, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible during our closing Q&A segment. I'd like to thank our interpreters, Denise Herrera and Rachel Abbott for their work this evening. For tonight's lecture, we welcome Stephanie Howard. With more than 25 years of experience, including a design directorship at Nike, lead designer at New Balance, and innovation director at Seventh Generation, Howard recently co-founded and launched Endstate, a company redefining product ownership by using NFTs to unite physical and digital experiences. Howard's award-winning consulting studio, How and Why, formed in 2010, guided visual brand language, product design, and innovation strategy for purpose-driven companies. Prior to that, she laid the foundation for advanced innovation strategy at seventh generation, voted in the top 10 of Fast Company Magazine's most innovative consumer products companies, and a leader in corporate responsibility. At Nike, she led the Women's Running Footwear Design Initiative and later set a creative vision as design director of Nike and Bauer Hockey. Howard has worked with brands including Nike, Bauer, Reebok, New Balance, Converse, The North Face, Vans, Timberland, Titleist, Tracksmith, and Smartwool. She has recently been featured in books including Sneaker Law under famous sneaker designers you should know, and London Design Museum Sneakers Unboxed. 
In the sneaker world, she's well known as the designer of the New Balance 850, which originally launched in 1996 and was re-released in 2019. Howard serves on the board of directors of Women in Sports Tech, an organization with a mission to drive growth opportunities for women in the sports tech landscape. RIT's current mission statement reads, quote, at Rochester Institute of Technology, we shape the future and improve the world through creativity and innovation. As an engaged, intellectually curious, and socially conscious community, we leverage the power of technology, the arts, and design for the greater good, end quote. I can't imagine a more appropriate demonstration of our mission in action than our guest alumna tonight. So please join me in a big virtual Vignelli Center welcome back for Stephanie Howard. Thanks, Josh. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be part of this lecture series. I graduated 27 years ago from RIT. Uh, my education there in industrial design set me up with a strong foundation at the beginning of my career, and I'm still truly grateful for it. Um, I'm excited to share uh, some of my journey with you uh, as I take you through these slides. So, I wanted to start with a quote from Massimo Vignelli. The very first thing that I do whenever I start a new assignment in any form of design, graphic, product, exhibition, or interior is to search for the meaning of it. While there are many great lessons given to us by the Vignellis, I chose this concept because it really resonates with me. Like we as designers are storytellers. So sometimes we're telling the story only of the function. Sometimes we're giving the user a platform for self-expression and sometimes it's a mix of all of those things. Uh, this concept of meaning, it really has evolved for me throughout my experience and throughout this talk, I'll be walking you through that evolution. I was fortunate right out of school, uh, graduated from industrial design, 1994, and I landed a job uh, at New Balance. And um, there I learned the performance needs of runners and about uh, biomechanics and all of that. Um, you know, that I, I needed to know to, to perform as a footwear designer. As a designer early on, I took the concept of designing with meaning uh, very literally, right? So you can see here, I built the design around um, flexibility, shock absorption, torsion control, lightweight structure, durability. Um, and I'd say that worked uh, at, on some level as a starting point. Then uh, I, this is a, this is the 850, the, the New Balance 850, a, a shoe that I um, probably in, in the sneaker world am most well known for. I pretty quickly realized when I was designing this um, that the things that we wear are the things that we identify with, um, and so I started to understand that there was this elusive concept of self-expression that I needed to consider, and not just performance benefits. Uh, so. The design of this shoe was the beginning of that exploration for me into this elusive concept of meaning in a different way. Uh, because of the uniqueness of this design for New Balance and the way that I was able to capture that concept of self-expression, it actually became iconic enough, as Josh mentioned, to be reissued in 2019. One of the biggest stories from the reissue was that it looked different from New Balance shoes um, that we're used to, right? Because we're so used to seeing um, the big N logo on the side of the shoes. Uh, so when I designed the shoe, uh, I was still pretty young and new at the job. Um, I was feeling really restricted by that, the large N logo that's typically put on the shoes. So I just started to work on concepts without it. I then proposed a way to sort of nuance that N logo. Uh, we called it at the time the flying N. Um, and that new logo, that new version of the logo allowed us to you know, work the designs and have um, the, the logo work in other areas of the shoe, gave me more room for creative freedom. Um, my manager at the time suggested that I create a proposal to present to the owner of New Balance. Um, with research on how branding evolves for different companies, some, some case studies. Um, it was really a brilliant idea on her part um, and it worked and I was really young and I didn't know any better to be scared. So I, I went, went, went for it. Um, 
uh, that manager's name was Edith Harmon. And unfortunately for the world and, and unfortunately for me, um, she has recently passed. Um, the reason I bring her up is because when I look back at my career, I can now see that there are a few big advocates of mine who had major impacts on my growth. And Edith had a huge impact for me. Um, she promoted me to lead designer of the, de of the design team at a very young age of 23. Um, she had all the confidence in the world that I would succeed even when I had none. <laughs> and um, my learnings from this is that everyone, young and old, should keep an eye out and notice who are these advocates that are in your lives and in your careers. Um, because they, they're the ones that shine a light on you before you're ready. Um, and it can be really profound. So keep a notice of that. Um, another learning for me as a designer when the shoe was, re was re-released in 2019 was how I had, I had grown as a designer so, so fond of minimalism. But now I was confronted with work that I had done a long time ago and it was kind of far from minimalism. And so when I was asked that question and I was uh, interviewed for Sneaker Freaker magazine and, and this is an excerpt from that with a quote, I said, minimalism is definitely close to my heart. I think that simplicity and a deep consideration for what is and what is not required is super important. But the human need for self-expression is a powerful force that can't be denied. And sometimes our state of mind requires much more than basic components when we're all trying to tell our individual stories. So I think that you can appreciate and design with minimalist intent, but also recognize that there are layers that can be built in design. And essentially there's just no one right way to do it. I was lead designer directing the team and working on all of these designs at New Balance. And I was still trying to access that combination of performance form and meaning through the styles. Um, although I look back at each of these and I really feel like I could critique each one. What I like about them is that they required bravery and pushing the boundaries in a company that at the time needed that kind of energy. Um, back in those days, there was a lot of recruiting between brands. So uh, I, I was enticed to move to Reebok because it was so much bigger and there was still a lot to learn and, you know, just had a lot of um, exciting things. And I felt like it was time for a change. Um, although, you know, pretty quickly in my career, I made this change. Our team was focused on ways to show the articulation of the mechanics of the foot. So this is an example of, um, of like a way of telling the story through design language of that articulation, but trying to do it so it's not too literal. And here are some more examples of the work I did there. I actually only spent a little over two years there. Uh, there was a lot of management changes and the brand strategy was a bit of a moving target at the time. Um, and so this here is like a place where I'll talk a little bit about perseverance um, because my time at Reebok, although short, you know, it, it, it came with its challenges and um, reminds me of a mantra that my father would often repeat to me when I was young and complaining about something. Life's not fair, Stephanie, he would always say. <laughs> like many of you have probably heard that before yourselves. Um, but I started to understand that, that there would be roadblocks in my career, um, which happens to the most of us at times. Um, I would assume probably happens a little bit more to women, people of color more often. Um, I'm a competitive person at heart. So uh, mostly I would say competitive with myself. So this experience of sort of feeling like I was stalling led me to an experiment. I said, if I could be the most knowledgeable in the room and if I could put in the most work and if I still did that and saw no gain from it, then I knew that there was a roadblock that I had to go around. Um, and so that, for me, it was a great lesson. And um, I started to look around. I happened to be very lucky because right as I was looking around, I also received a call from Nike. Um, and that was a, a very good move for me, <laughs> very different experience for me than my Reebok experience. Um, so I was recruited to Nike for a position in women's running. 
and they had just recently started to explore women's specific designs for runners. Um, and, you know, it was just this perfect way for me to sort of dive deep into the insights and why, uh, what would the meaning be for a women's specific design separate from a men's running design? We had to start with insights. And Nike, in my experience when I was there, is a master at finding ways to glean insights. And I'm super grateful for my time spent there. Uh, for this project, we uncovered some learnings that led us to three focus areas, fit, safety, and time. And now, um, you know, we were really getting into that idea of meaningful product creation. Um, fit may be maybe the most obvious for us. Uh, many of you know that shoes are designed around a sort of plastic foot form called last. The Nike team had done research to create a new women's specific last and that would anatomically fit better. Uh, so again, the most obvious to start with, but you know, we knew that um, it was also important to the runners that we were serving. Uh, also, you know, knowing that the last was different, you can't really show that to runners. So part of the design language that I, I created in the collection brought attention to the secure heel fit, which was a major benefit of this new last design. Now, safety uh, was another insight. One of the differences between the experiences of men and women runners is the vulnerability that women feel at times when they're running alone. I used to run on a trail near the city of Portland when I was there for work, um, which was at times fairly busy, but sometimes there would be parts of the run where I felt insecure and alone. Um, so this of course was before iPhones. <laughs> It dating myself a little bit. Uh, and you know, the security that we feel with them now in these situations, we didn't have that back then. So I talked to the team about incorporating a safety whistle that could be worn around the wrist while running. Um, and it could be stored in a pocket on the tongue of the shoe when it was not in use. Uh, it was quite a task to do while creating the collection of shoes and creating this whistle and testing all the product. Um, a, a bit of a, a large task uh, on a tight timeline. Um, but I do remember feeling like that the power of that insight when we read um, a thank you note that we received from a mom of a teenage runner who was really grateful that we thought of this, right? It's a, it's a sign of how much uh, we can impact if we dig deep enough with our insights. So time, our third big insight for this women's collection, it was 2000, uh, the year 2000, sorry. And that was seven years before the iPhone, but we saw that people's lifestyles were much more mobile than ever before. And as a result, women, at least seemingly more than men, were expressing the pressure of time famine. And I think we uncovered insights that eventually led to a whole new category of footwear that we know today as athleisure, but that didn't fully take hold until like another 10 years later. Um, it just goes to show if you dig deep enough on these insights, you have a really great window into the emerging future. Uh, so these are sketches of a modular concept of a spring summer shoe. Uh, and the idea is that they could work 24 seven. So as long as you're out, if you need to go on a run, if you're you know, out casually, this is the shoe for you. Uh, it had a, I'll switch to the next slide. It had a midfoot strap that could secure the fit for running or it could be taken off for casual use. Uh, and, and so it was really meant to sort of work with our new mobile lifestyle. So then I made a bit of a career expansion, I'll call it here. Um, I learned of an opening at Nike Bauer, which was a subsidiary of Nike at the time, was their hockey division. Um, I jumped at the opportunity. I was excited to immerse myself in something new uh, and the purity of the sport of hockey intrigued me. And uh, I actually had played a lot of roller hockey uh, during my time at Reebok. So I had some background. I was not an ice hockey player, but um, I knew there was a lot to learn and I got really excited about, you know, sort of expanding what I was doing. Um, I started off as the, the um, lead designer for all of the Nike branded products. So that included inline skates, which were a 
big fad at the time, um, especially in Europe. So I would travel to Europe, and we'd get to participate in these citywide skate events. Um, they would close the streets of Munich. I think it was on Monday nights and everybody would skate through the city. Um, it was really, really fun. I actually wish that all of that came back. Uh, we could use that these days. Um, but uh, it was you know, also really exciting to work on these inline skates because they were Nike branded. So I could do a lot with innovation um, under that umbrella. And believe it or not, roller skating almost made a comeback in 2001. Um, so I designed a line of roller skates for Nike. Uh, very fun project. Um, I think it's just still pretty hard to roller skate on pavement outside of a roller rink. So <laughs> it didn't last that long, but it, it, it was uh, fun and had a little bit of a PR buzz to it. <laughs> All right, so the hockey side of the business. Uh, eventually I was promoted to design director for all of Nike Bauer. And I actually remember the HR, um, the person who headed up HR at the time, you know, sat me down and said, oh, you're like a little Petri dish. You're a girl, you're leading a team of all men. Um, they're in Montreal, you're in uh, Boston. This is gonna be really exciting to watch. Uh, but it turned out actually to be amazing. And I had a really talented team of designers working with me. Um, and uh, what was happening at the time was that when I got to Nike Bauer Hockey originally, the Nike products and the Bauer products competed with the same price points, um, but they were created by different teams. So our new CEO realized that it would be best to share the expertise across both brands since we competed in that way with the same product and price points. Um, so what happened first was we absolutely had to be very clear on the brand positioning. So the marketing department created um, specific positionings for each brand. So this is an example. These are from catalogs. Um, whereas Bauer was the unstoppable heart of hockey because that was, you know, they were, they were there from the beginning, you know, they were the um, authentic, a very authentic brand in the minds of hockey players. And Nike was a little bit newer to um, the sport. And so, you know, they were, they had to be careful with how innovative they were, but, you know, they were, they were about like sort of fast forward thinking the breakaway hockey player. And so, it was my job, now that these positionings were created, it was my job to create a visual brand language for each of the brands based on that positioning. And that would work across all of the lines of the skates, the sticks, the helmets, the gloves, the protective equipment, et cetera. Uh, so I would work with the design team and we would define how these unique expressions would manifest in the physical product designs. Here's some of the Nike skates that I designed while I was there and a Bauer skate. But <laughs> for a very short period of time, the two brands merged uh, and they were called Nike Bauer altogether. Um, I was not a fan of the concept of the merge, um, but I did create this design for the Vapor skate. Um, it was built around light, strong architecture uh, because the innovation team had created this amazing, super light, very strong and flexible um, material. And so the design language was created based on this light strong architecture concept. And that endured, that language endured for quite a few years as uh, you know, the line continued to grow. Um, and this was actually one of the most worn skates in the NHL. Okay, so, so this is not a, I'm not gonna talk about soap for 20 minutes at all. Um, it's a metaphor in my career for a big pivot. Um, so it's also a big pivot that I hadn't really planned for. Uh, my manager from Nike moved to seventh generation and he invited me to direct their innovation strategy. He knew that I longed to do work in social responsibility. I had talked to him about that a lot. Um, and this seemed like a great place for me to start because they were so driven towards um, you know, doing things differently and all about sustainable products. So I took a leap of faith and I made this big career change. There was a lot of openness for big ideas. And so the front end of innovation was where I started. Uh, a teammate and I discovered this molded pulp milk bottle from a European company. Um, we started to conceptualize how that could work with our products, um, you know, especially for us in, in laundry detergent. 
and when I kind of point out the front end here, you know, innovation takes a long time. And um, I was at seventh generation, I think three years, and I had left seventh generation before this bottle the, on the right side here, um, before it was actually launched, you know, because it, it takes a good, you know, three to five years to, you know, get some of the, the big innovations out. And sometimes, you know, uh, you know, from my experience at Nike, you can see things take 10 years and, and longer. Um, but you can see how starting early and thinking big can, can make a really big difference. Um, and so it's, it's really exciting work for me in the innovation space to be at the front end. Insight gathering is really key in consumer packaged goods companies, um, even more so than you know, when I was at, you know, say, Nike or Reebok. Um, and I think the insight gathering is key because it's just a little bit more sort of risk averse to put products out into the market for the consumer packaged goods brands. Um, so we would dig really, really deep in our research. For a diaper innovation project, we did this ethnographic research in homes all across the country. So I went to homes um, of new moms, spent time with them as they were, you know, with their babies, diapering their babies. And, you know, we learned so much about their needs, their concerns. Um, we could chart out a sustainability spectrum where the different types of moms fell along that spectrum. So we could understand, um, you know, where we should spend our time innovating, uh, where we could uh, look in the future, um, and where we should start. So I continued this pivot. <laughs> um, during the time I was at seventh generation, I became a new mom as well. Uh, so I it was traveling actually back and forth between Boston and Vermont. Uh, Vermont is where the seventh generation headquarters was, and I was living in Boston. Um, it was becoming too much uh, to do that travel with a new baby. Um, and I was also at the time being recruited for some full-time positions, you know, back in the, um, you know, through my network in the athletic space. Um, and I knew how much I loved working on innovation programs. Um, and that's when I started to you know, really think about like, what is it that I wish to spend my time doing? Um, and when I was thinking through that, I realized how much the why of innovation and how that influenced the how we do things meant so much to me. And yet I could see so many companies were focused on the what <laughs> in their project briefs. And so when I bring up these words, why, how, what, um, it, they, they were inspired from a, a TED talk that I had seen that I hope many of you have seen. And if you haven't, it's worth your time uh, by Simon Sinek. Um, and he really sort of breaks down why you know, leaders and brands, why some are you know, very, very successful and some aren't. Um, so please do check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, so for this reason, I decided to forego any in-house full-time positions and to start my own consulting services. So luckily my network was strong and I had some great long-term relationships with brands. Um, as you can see here, New Balance, I came full circle. <laughs> um, but I had, uh, during my time consulting, I worked with um, long-term with New Balance, with VF Corp, which owns Timberland, the North Face, they own Vans. Um, and Titleist Golf Gear also um, as a client as well. And it was, you know, it's just really nice for me as a consultant not to have to sort of scramble from project to project, but to have these long-term relationships where I was really an extension of their innovation team. So here are some examples of the New Balance work I did while consulting. Um, I worked on innovation projects based on new ways of working with materials, um, maximizing cushioning, maximizing comfort. Uh, so a lot of it was that sort of front end of innovation. Um, and, uh, you know, it involved a lot of experimentation and exploration. Um, but also, you know, I was working as a consultant, they also would utilize me to work on designs that would launch to the market. Um, those are referred to as inline projects. And um, there's usually a big stage gate process of something that starts 
uh, as a front end of innovation project moves through all the different, um, you know, sort of proof of concept phases, and then eventually it moves into the inline project when it's ready to be um, created for the market. Um, my work was really expanding as a consultant, and uh, one of the projects that I did uh, was to creative direct a video that was explaining the principles of Vans innovation to the stakeholders of VF Corp. Uh, so this was all about focusing on the why, right? The why is, why are we doing what we're doing? And why is that important to the stakeholders? Uh, and so we were bringing the concepts forth uh, to get everybody on board. Uh, it was, a, for me, it was a great storytelling experiment. Uh, really, really enjoyed that type of work. I wish I could show you the whole video because it came out pretty cool, but unfortunately I can't. Uh, project Better was a um, really big project for me when I worked for VF Corp for Timberland. Uh, it won an IDA award in 2019. Uh, it was an amazing project to work on because it started with a very, very broad question about how we could create an innovation platform around the concept of wellness. Uh, so we started to do research. Um, we decided to do a deep dive in Amsterdam, which is a city very much at the heart of wellness. Um, and the insights led us to create a collection of shoes that filled this white space. So we, we you know, this, this was a pretty deep, deep dive. We went to people's homes. Um, we met with thought leaders in the area. And um, what we learned was, you know, among many things um, was that there was this white space between athleisure and sneakers that people really wanted to wear and their dress shoes that they really had to wear for certain occasions. And so people were seeking something in between, you know, a very comfortable but smarter shoe. Uh, so we created a innovation platform and uh, worked with a lot of natural materials. Uh, we received a patent on the innovation and the system that we created, which was called Comfort in Motion. Uh, it was a really, really fun project because we took it from, again, idea, very big, broad concept of wellness, all the way through to a collection, to an innovation, to a platform. When I say innovation platform, that means these shoes, this collection, can uh, you know be out of the market because it's you know not in in you know the season is over and the platform of the innovation can be used again over and over in new shoes for new seasons. I also worked with Titleist, uh, their gear division, so not in footwear, um, on many innovation projects. Some that are you know still in the works and very excited for when they come out. Um, but I also did, you know, outside of innovation, for them, I, I worked on creative direction. So when they first launched a more focused approach to their golf and travel, travel bag line, um, that's when I, I came on board and helped with creative direction. And there I created a guide for the visual brand language that would work consistently across the line, as well as design cues that, while subtle, would bring the collection together um, with some cohesive detailing. All right, so one more pivot here. Um, though I had no plan for it, something was about to change again um, in my career and, and there was a catalyst for it. I was involved, um, invited to speak on a panel uh, for a book that was launching called Sneaker Law. I was highlighted uh, in the section called Famous Sneaker Designers You Should Know. I found a little humorous that somehow I was considered famous, uh, but nevertheless, it was a great honor to be acknowledged this way. Uh, in the audience, when I was on this webinar, in the audience was a person named Bennett Collin, who I had yet to meet, um, and he realized that I could be a potential co-founder for a concept that he had been brewing in the blockchain space. And this was pretty much a year ago now, and last week we officially launched our brand End State. Uh, End state is in the world of NFTs, um, which you know we're calling and and talking about in a very sort of meaningful way as the future of product ownership. And it would 
take an entire another lecture, which I'm not going to <laughs> give today, to really explain so I, where I think NFTs are going and Web3, which is the space that NFTs are in. Um, I highly recommend uh, if you're really interested in learning more about Web3 and where I think the world is moving towards, I recommend a uh, podcast by Tim Ferriss where he interviews Chris Dixon of A16Z. Uh, it's, it's a really, really well sort of described interview that explains, again, we're, we're, you know, what the emerging future is. Um, for end state, I'm going to read you this um, because it really helps to describe what we're all about. And um, it's really exciting to be in a uh, company and product and creating a product that has so much involved with it. And it's also really hard because there's a lot, of, lot to tell you <laughs> all at once um, and a lot for you to absorb. So at Endstate, we're creating the future of product ownership by marrying physical and digital products and distributing the value created by these products more fairly. So because we're selling NFTs that go along with physical products um, and they're in the blockchain, um, if we collaborate with creators, artists, uh, athletes, other designers, um, what happens is usually a collaboration it, you know, say a collectible sneaker is sold and uh, the, they, the people that create the sneaker are rewarded once. Um, but if there's subsequent resales of the sneaker or say artwork, then they are not rewarded um, in any way for the subsequent resale. Uh, but because NFTs have a smart contract in the blockchain, the uh, creator can continue to get royalties on the products that they work on when they're, sorry to explain this, when they're on the secondary market, when they're resold again. Uh, so we are starting with sneakers. We work at the intersection of collaborations and NFTs. We're partnering with creators to bring their stories to life by making both a physical product to wear and creating a digital twin. Uh, and so that's pretty exciting for us, right? A lot of people are involved in NFTs and creating digital products. And we are sort of tethering those two together and creating a physical product as well. And by using NFTs, we can unite experiences from digital art to physical product to special access to our collaborators and their communities and the ability to wear the shoes in the metaverse, including video games and other online environments. So this is the part about NFTs that I think um, many people don't understand if they think of an NFT as a JPEG of art or maybe a digital file only. Uh, NFTs are give people the ability to uh, be very innovative and create access. So if, um, in our case, we're working with collaborations of, you know, with, with a creator who has a great story to tell, we design a product for them around their story. And um, when somebody, when a, a fan of theirs purchases the product, they also could unlock special access, right? Maybe be in a Discord community where they get to communicate with this creator that they're really excited about. Um, maybe they get special passes to an event that's coming up for this um, creator. And there's there's many many things that an NFT can unlock, and um, and I think the the world is still at the sort of very beginning of what that innovation can be. It's a very exciting space to be in, and uh, we as I said we just launched last week. I'll give you a little bit of details. We launched um, Friday, and we sold out uh, within an hour. So we were very very excited. Um, to have <laughs> to, to put all this work in um, to have a successful launch and um, we're you know we're starting the next day so this is an image but I'm going to take you to our website so you can see it a little bit in real time all right Josh let me know you can see the website up there yep all right um, so this is what it looks like so these N nfts are these digital files um, and this is of the sneaker design and the background it, environment that the sneakers are in is um, created by human artists that worked with artificial intelligence and the inspiration for this creation is this is the evolution of digital technology and the human experience so we we've, we thought a lot about sort of what our brand represents 
and and we're able to work with these artists to sort of turn it into a a story that sits in the environment that the shoes are in. Um, so here again, the explanation is we're making both physical sneakers and NFTs, and that these NFTs unlock these exclusive experiences for the people that own them. Um, there's a section on our website about how it works because this is in the cryptocurrency space. So I would say nothing in cryptocurrency is probably risk-free uh, and, um, and, and it's not easy and um, turnkey yet, but I would say there's lots of people working on the technology and um, it, it will be simpler and simpler to, to purchase these types of products. We still have one shoe that's up for auction. So this is one that was sold out, um, but we still have one up for auction. So if you're interested to learn more uh, about what's going on, the I would say follow along on our socials. Uh, it's at end state on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, kind of see our journey as, as it unfolds in real life. I have to tell you the, the, the experience of being in a startup is like no other. <laughs> and um, so much, so much, it brings me so much joy. There's just, uh, you know, it's, it's tons and tons of work, but um, just as much fun as it is work. So I hope that my journey without a roadmap <laughs> helps you realize that uh, you don't have to figure it all out now um, or ever because uh, many, many things will sort of send you in different directions, but each chapter guides the next. And, um, you know, the best advice is always just work as hard as you can and, and to get through each one. And uh, I'll turn it over for questions. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful uh, discussion, uh, Stephanie. I, I was so taken by the, the path uh, that you uh, shared with us. Um, and I think in particular, uh, for me, um, the, the empathic reasoning um, that you bring, uh, especially from a, a woman-centered perspective uh, to so much of your experiences was, was really enlightening and, and um, inspiring to hear. Um, I won't lie, there are a lot of questions um, <laughs> that are coming in. So I'm going to do my best to jump right in and honor uh, as many as we can get to. Um, and, and I'll apologize in advance to all the people who are sending in questions that uh, there are many for me to try to uh, get through. So um, I'm going to start with uh, somebody who is clearly researching your work. Uh, in your interview with the Boston Globe in 1996, they asked you, what's the wild wildest future running shoe idea you can imagine what would you say to that today oh, <laughs> oh my goodness that's that's a tricky one what would i say the wildest <laughs> um boy uh maybe something that something that's in the um levitation space right so i i think this is coming from someone who's aging as a runner right that that uh, sometimes the the, the joints and the, and the knees don't work as well as you get older so it would be nice to have shock absorption if i could run while levitating but i'm not sure if that's really the wildest one like that's the first one i came up with on the spot that, that's a good answer i thought you were going to go to uh running zero g which may okay, be yeah. in not too distant future um like great uh Another question, what has the experience of working with US factories for the development of the shoe been like? Ooh, that's good. Because I was just thinking, whoa, I can't believe I just give this presentation and forgot to mention I am making these shoes in the USA. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Thank you, whoever asked that question. Um, it is very complex. Um, it is, uh, everything you know, has been in, in Asia for a very long time. So there's a lot of systems in place and a lot of vendors that are connected and that isn't existing here. And so everything has to be sort of worked out and created by us and the connections have to be made by us. And everything is of course much more expensive 
um, because of that. But it, I am super committed to doing this. And so is my business partner um, because we just feel like it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for our brand. And, um, you know, we know that people care about the, the brands and the consciousness of what brands are doing. Um, I certainly have a big roadmap and, you know, planned ahead of all the things that we'll be working on, you know, to, to continue to do everything better. But, uh, but Made in the USA is really important to me. So I can't give you all the details. <laughs> I can't give you all the secrets either. But it is, it is complex because the systems aren't in place and all these vendors are not connected to each other. So I have to make all of those connections. Um, but we do have um, some amazing partners who have been working with us and putting in a lot of effort. And um, I'm just super fortunate to, to know them. And some have been through my network of people I've worked with in the past and very thankful for those uh, relationships. Mm. Um, I'm glad that you brought up relationships because another question that came in uh, was about relationships. And um, I'm, I'm actually paraphrasing because I can't find it in the stream here, but it had something to do with um, tracing back your network to RIT. How many people um, in your current world uh, sort of trace back to your origins uh, in school? Yeah. Um well, the first thing I can think of is that, you know, I landed a job at New Balance and one of the, the maybe, I don't know if it's the reason I landed it, but the way I knew about it was I had interviewed at a design firm in Boston that had an RIT alum. And I thought I was going to work in the consulting world right out of school. And he said, hey, you know, we have some work for you, but you'd have to be a freelancer. You know, why don't you talk to some people within the network? And one of the names within the network was somebody at New Balance who was also an RIT alum. So just even getting kicked off in my career uh, had a lot to do with RIT alum. But I, I have um, quite a few friends in Boston who are industrial designers um, who came from RIT, uh, none from my year, um, but uh, you know, we, we all, it's a very friendly community in Boston of industrial designers. Uh, we, we, not in the COVID years, but prior to that, we would get together often and um, lots of RIT alumni out here. Oh, it's good, good advice and words for our, uh, our young designers here at RIT. Uh, another question that came in was, um, can you speak about your experiences as a female designer in a male dominated industry like footwear and what advice would you give for young female designers? Yeah, I would say that in my experience as a female designer, uh, I have run into people who are doubters, right? Just automatic doubters. At the same time, I want to say not everybody is that. And I've also run into probably the same amount who are just big, big advocates. And, um, and you know, they, they both exist, right? So don't, don't go into the workplace thinking, oh, every time I see a male coworker, they are a doubter, because that is not the truth. Some are very, very big advocates for you. Um, but when I do run into those doubters, uh, you know, my, my sort of mode of operating is to work the absolute hardest I can, right? So if I can try to be the most educated in the room about the subject that we're talking about, if I can um, work super hard on the project that I'm working on, if I can do everything in my power to, um, to create something successful, and that still doesn't work, um, then, you know, then I realize that that's a roadblock. I think I mentioned that earlier, right? There, there's roadblocks at times, and you need to work around them. Um, but, you know, before you sort of leave something, you know, look for the advocates because th those people, if you're working that hard and you're doing that much, there are people out there that are recognizing it and, you know, and find them and, and they can help you sort of, again, shine that light on you. Um, it's not, you know, I, I think it's that, <laughs> I brought it up earlier too, right? Life's not fair. Like, you know, nothing's ever perfect. And um, I don't think one, sh you know, it, it was never in my, um, my way of operating to, complain and, and feel bad about it. It was just, it's either a roadblock and I have to go around it or, um, or I work hard and, you know, sort of prove that I'm able to do it. Great. Thank you for that. Um, another question that came in was, um, how does working alongside innovation teams as a design consultant differ from your experience of working on those teams? And do you still have the opportunity to sketch and get into the details of your design? 
yeah, so I definitely was full in on, you know, on these projects that I was given. So yes, definitely still able to sketch and, and get into the details. Um, the difference, I think a few things, I think more often than not, having a voice from the outside was a good thing, was a positive thing, right? So I could bring um, ideas to the table from a little bit more outside of the vacuum of that brand. Um, and that would often be recognized as a positive. Um, I think one of the benefits for me as a consultant was uh, when somebody's paying you as a consultant, they're also like inviting you to less of the tedious meetings. <laughs> and so, um, you know, they, they value your time in different ways, I suppose. <laughs> that was a nice thing. Uh, I appreciated that. Great. Um, here's a good one. Um, how do design trends influence you? Do you try to design within a trend or do you stick to your own approach? Yeah, so especially in footwear, um, there's two levels of trend, right? So uh, the first is macro trend and below that would be a seasonal trend. So macro trends are these shifts in culture and social happenings. And I spend a lot of time, you know, I'm talking about the why, why should we do something? It's all about what's on the emerging future. And so to study macro trends and try to figure out how the world is shifting in new ways and how that might affect my design, I spend a lot of time in that sort of mind space. Uh, in terms of seasonal trends, um, depending on when you're working on it, if you're working on an inline design um, that has to meet a certain sort of mainstream market, then it's also important to understand what the seasonal trends are and to, to follow them, but to find your voice in there. And often it's not your own personal voice, it's the brand that you're working for's voice, right? Their voice, everything in a seasonal trend document still has to be filtered through what should that be for Nike? What should that be for New Balance, right? So that's, um, so it's not just following a trend because somebody said it's probably going to be true. And these trend agencies are self-fulfilling prophecies. So right, it right. probably will be true. Um, but it's, it's, you know, both are important, but I very much love to live in the space of thinking about macro trends. Right, right. Here's a follow-up question to that that just came in. Are there any trends in design that you hate? <laughs> no, I mean, I just, the hate is too strong a word. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I think, I mean, there, there are many, many trends I don't follow um, or I don't subscribe to, um, but no, I'm, I'm just not that. I think I, I feel like being open-minded in design is just the best way to go. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with no hating of any trends. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a wonderful answer. Um, so uh, switching gears a little bit, um, a question just came in, um, were there any different or interesting challenges for you while working in the hockey industry compared to your previous experiences in footwear? Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> talk about the, the, um, the doubters. Um, there, there were a lot of doubters um, in the space for, you know, because I was a woman. Um, and the design team had been reporting to uh, development for a very long time. And then suddenly they were switching and reporting to me. And so the doubters weren't in the design team, as far as I can tell. I think we all really had a great cohesive working environment. It was uh, the people that they used to work with that, um, that gave me some challenges. But, but other than that, outside of you know, the, that, the, um, I think just designing, designing for pro athletes um, it wasn't necessarily challenging, but it was, it was just very exciting. Like we would meet with them and we would have to understand all the nuances of what would make them peak at their performance mm -hmm. and design that into the product. And so you just, maybe I felt the, the weight of that in a different way because this was somebody's professional career and, you know, I could sort of help it or I could hurt it. And so I, it was, it was definitely felt, um, important to make sure that I understood all the nuances. Yeah, got it. All right, now I'm going to take you back to RIT because there are a whole bunch of questions that are oh, RIT. Nice. <laughs> um, and I got, I, I got to handle some of them for, for these students who I assume are asking. Um, what made you choose RIT? Ah, okay. 
Um, huh. I think the best answer to that from my, it's a very fuzzy memory was uh, I wasn't entirely sure if I was going to stay in design. Um, I was, you know, I came from just the a school, you know, a, a public high school in Connecticut, and nobody had ever heard of industrial design before. I was very, very fortunate that an art teacher of mine told me what it was, and I realized that was the perfect thing for me. Um, but I wasn't always sure because I was a, a very strong math and science um, student, and so all roads were leading to engineering for me. And so when I picked design because I really liked art and I didn't quite know exactly what I was going into in this industrial design world, um, I, I knew I wanted to have a fallback that might be in the engineering space. And so RIT really you know, felt like the right school for that. Um, so I think that was a big part of the decision making. Hmm, that's a good answer. Um, we, we do see a lot of people who, who gravitate here and um, are in between design and engineering. So I, I'm not uh, surprised to hear that about you. Um, just dovetailing into that, um, do you have uh, any important or strong memories from your time uh, studying industrial design at RIT? I do. There were a lot of all-nighters in the studio. I don't know if they still do that now. <laughs> um, okay. And we did a lot of um, hand model making. Um, I don't know if you still do a lot of the hand, because now there's you can 3D print things. But back then, every project ended, you know, the, at the end of the semester, you had to hand make your model in the wood shop. And you know, and, and use all the paints and everything to make it look like ex, as, as real as possible. Um, and so, so, I just have great fond memories of all the people that were in the program at the time. We we had really fun um, camaraderie, very very late at night in the studio. Um, I think we weren't allowed in the wood shop, but somebody knew where the key was, and so they would open it up after hours, and we'd all be in there spray mount you know spray painting our <laughs> models and things um but yeah it was it was very fun um sort of really big relationship building and um but also you know stress i mean just no sleep for a week <laughs> at a time <laughs> i don't even know how i survived but somehow well, at this moment in the semester I, I have a feeling there are a lot of students out there listening <laughs> with a great deal of sympathy for okay. our, uh, uh, camaraderie with that kind of uh uh, statement. Nice. Um, so uh, trying to find the question. Oh, yeah. Um, dialing away from RIT again um, and going back home to, uh, to Boston. Um, a question that I think is, is, a, is a good one is, um, what does a day in your life look like as one who um, is running your own business and, uh, and managing lots of projects? Yeah. Um, now with, you know, as a startup, a, a, a day in my life, it's so hard to, to describe even to my own self, because my days have completely changed from anything that I've ever done before, because there's just two of us that are, you know, in this, we, we do work with other, you know, groups that are consulting with us, but we are, you know, we are brand, I designed the brand, right? I designed, we, we created the name, we had to get the trademark, we had to, um, you know, every single decision for everything that we do, building the website, how we're going to communicate, um, what we're going to do on social, like everything is just two people. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and we have, you know, we have, we're working with these engineers, I mean, being in this blockchain space is also quite complex right now. And so um, every day I, I tell people like every day I start, I have this to-do list that is just massive and there's no way I can get through it. And I end the day doubling that to-do list. <laughs> and so it does feel overwhelming uh, at times because I just, there's so many things I, I have to do. Um, and I certainly can't get to every single one on every single day. And I work many, 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 many more hours than maybe I ever have since those days at RIT. <laughs> but, um, but also feel so worth it, right? Like I, all these years of learning and feeling like I understand, um, you know, in, in my opinion, the best ways of doing things, you know, I get to put them into practice 
um, with my partner and, and, you know, we, we get along really well and, and um, are, you know, putting everything in to build this together. Great. Well, I'm going to do two more questions uh, before okay. we wrap up. The first one is um, you mentioned you could do a whole talk about the future of MFT, <laughs> NFTs. Uh, could you briefly talk about that and, and how do physical products tethered to NFTs really work in your opinion? Oof, uh, yeah, so that's a long answer. So I'm going to try to, um, ultimately, the uh, people will describe it as they'll say, everything changed when, you know, everybody got the internet. And then everything changed again, when everything went mobile. And now the prediction is everything's going to change again with what's called web three. So NFTs are just a part of this web three. Um, it's the, the overall concept is that, um, Right now, almost everything on the internet, especially for creators, as an example, is owned by these big platforms, right? So if you're a YouTuber, YouTube owns it. If you're, you know, have a ton of followers on Instagram, Facebook owns it. If you're a musician on Spotify, they own it. And um, what is going to happen soon will be that creators will be able to have their own ways of you know, connecting with their fans or, or connecting with their supporters, um, monetizing that, um, you know, creating communities uh, and owning their own property and the rights to that in on the internet. And, you know, you hear about the metaverse, that's you know, likely not that far away. People are going to want to own their own property in the digital realm as much as they want to own it in the physical realm. And all of that is going to just be more fairly distributed in this new space and less owned by a few big corporations. Right. Well, I think that was a pretty succinct, succinct answer to a potentially uh, extra lecture. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, that, that um, podcast that I mentioned, I think it's over two hours. <laughs> they probably just scratched the surface too. Well, thanks for the cliff notes. Um, all right, I'm going to hit you with a, a, a super challenging last question. You ready? Mm -hmm. How many pairs of shoes do you own? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I don't know the number, but it's, it's literally just not that many because I am not a collector. So what I learned when my shoes started coming back into, um, you know, the limelight, I guess, was I hadn't even kept shoes that I designed. And so I've been going through on Instagram you know, talking to different collectors and say, hey, do you have a pair of these? So I'm just trying to collect back a pair, doesn't even have to be in my size, but just so I can own some of these designs that I, you know, I'm showing nice pictures of, um, but I, I didn't even collect those. Uh, so I don't know how many pairs I have. It's probably in the, you know, 20-ish, 30-ish uh, realm, but um, certainly not like a lot of the, the sneakerhead collectors out there. I I can't compare myself and I do wish I had kept more. Well, I think that's a, that's a good answer. You're probably just placated a, a, a student who is very interested to know what a sneaker designer uh, wears or keeps in their closet. Yeah. Stephanie, this has been such a, an honor and a pleasure. Uh, it's been a, a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your work and your life with us. Um, we look forward to hosting you on campus uh, one of these days soon when we get back to a little bit more normalcy uh, and, uh, and have, your, have you back uh, to share your, your insights with us uh, in a more direct way. So take good care. Thanks everybody for Thank coming you. tonight and, uh, and for your many questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. Um, look out for uh, stuff on our social. Uh, that's coming up, the Beyond Fashion event that uh, will be December 10th. And uh, for next semester's exciting Vignelli Design Conversations lectures to come. Thank you again, Stephanie. Uh, have a Thank great you. night. Stay safe. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone.